Well, welcome to Palm Sunday, as, as Al so ably said. And I love hearing and seeing Josh Turner. For those of you that don't know, Josh Turner's my other kid. We never signed the official papers, but that's, that's my guy. Uh, he, he calls me dad, or da, because the Irish. But uh, call him son and have for a long time. So it's always good to see Josh up there. Um, this, is a, this is a continuation of the longest continually performed religious ceremony in the history of mankind. For 3,500 years, this has been celebrated. This week, starting this Sunday, ending next Sunday at Easter. This last week, Jews around the world asked us, Gentiles, to join with them as they prayed at the West Wall for peace, to pray the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Chinu, Adonai Chad. Hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. It was a very touching time. Uh, it really was. Tears flowed freely as we prayed a prayer that is over 3,500 years old and yet is said every morning and every evening by every observant Jew and by many, many, many Gentiles who are also believers. In a very dark and distant time, this began. Hope had been lost. Slaves huddled in fear the first time this was done. God breaks in and he safely, he's, he brings safety. He brings life. His angel stalks the land protecting his people. And they're setting the stage for freedom. Think about that night. You've never seen the story. You've never heard the story. You don't know how this is going to work. And then you're told, eat this. Put blood outside. Don't go outside because an angel of death is stalking the land. The only light you have in the closed rooms are little tallow candles that are really bowls of oil with a string in it. I've got a couple back here. If you're at the sound stage sometime, you can see them. They're reproductions. They're not originals, obviously. I don't have that kind of access. And those treasures need to belong there, not taken away. But very little light, the shadows. And you would be hearing the wind outside. You'd be hearing the movement of things outside. And the story was about to move in ways that none of them could have ever anticipated. The story is familiar to most of us who are church folk, one sort or another. But like all good stories, it needs to be reviewed. And we need to retell it from time to time to set the stage for our own story. And that's how stories work. We tell the stories of brave people. And we tell the stories of courage under fire. And that's what motivates us to be brave and to do brave things. It's tragic, actually, the modern tendency to find any hero and say, here are the flaws. Ignore the person. Here, that story probably didn't happen. Throw that story away. When stories are the second most powerful thing in the universe. And stories are what drive us forward. We need stories. Kids want stories. They'll read the same story or ask you to read the same story to them a thousand times. And they know if you've skipped a word, so don't try. They need the story. So do we. History did not begin 10 minutes ago. We need the stories. So let's begin. The Jews had gone to Egypt many years before as honored guests. A grateful Pharaoh had reached out to Joseph and because of Joseph's help in helping them survive a famine that was coming, he said, bring your family. And so Joseph did. And the people we would later call the people of Israel move into Egypt. And by the way, the DNA proves all of this occurred. It shows we can trace it back and say, yeah, they are related. Yes, this was an ancient intertwining and it happened more than just once but this is our story for the day a change of regime a regime have happened however and 
After many years of being honored guests and living in the best places and being fruitful and multiplying as God had asked them to do at the end of, uh, of Genesis and at the end of the flood, a new regime comes in, overthrows the pharaohs of the day. They now are the pharaohs and they don't have any thing to do with these Jews who are here. They don't owe them anything. These people didn't help them and quite frankly they seem to be a bit of a problem because there's so many of them. If they can't win them over it could be possible that they could rise up against the new pharaohs and so suddenly the new pharaohs send their armies in and overnight the Jews go from honored guest to the lowest of slaves worked to death on purpose so that they would no longer be an issue, whittling down the people. Don't just kill them, you get nothing out of them that way. But if you do slavery, then they will build things for you. And it will also take care of that population problem. They were made less than people. Because that's what you have to do if you're going to enslave somebody. You've got to look upon them as less than people. And here's another lesson in the old story. God's timing is never our timing. I have a great amount of suggestions for God. I really do. God, do this now. Do that now. And stop doing that. And if you would, you know, turn these people into frogs, it would be a personal favor. But God's timing is never our timing. Moses was ready to act. Unlike the movies that you might have seen, Moses always knew he was a Jew. He was raised from birth to know he was a Jew in the house of Pharaoh. That had not been a problem for a while, but it was a problem now. And when Moses was 40 and fit and ready to lead his people to freedom, God wasn't ready and the people weren't ready. And Moses had to flee to the desert. He found a new people there, made a new family. He settled in that culture, in that family, in that system. He was head of sheep, Sinai division. He was doing well. And then when he was 80 years old, God was ready. Moses was not. But it didn't matter. Moses gave God all kinds of reasons why this would never work. And God just said, what's in your hand? After Moses had told him all the things I don't have... He says, what do you have? He goes, well, a stick. God used an 80-year-old and a stick to overthrow the system in Egypt. It's amazing. If you look up the history of slave rebellions, what you find is whether it's Spartacus or Gabriel Prosser or Denmark Vassy or Nat Turner, they all fail. When you think they should, they should have succeeded, but they didn't. And yet, here's an 80-year-old guy with a stick, and this one works, and works spectacularly. Moses goes in, faced with Pharaoh's stubbornness, God unleashes a series of plagues upon the gods of Egypt. They worship the sun, so he blotted it out. They worship the Nile, so he turned it red like blood. Even the water in their pots went that way to show them, no, you can't get away from God or prepare for his attack in such a way that you're not affected. They worship cattle, long story. God gave them uh, the cattle disease. They worship the God of the earth. And so God made the earth crawl with insects that plagued them. They worshiped frogs. Again, anything connected with food or water, they worship. And in fact, the, the midwives of the Egyptians who were charged by the Pharaoh to kill the male Hebrew children as soon as they were born, worshiped a frog-headed god named Hecate. And if you killed a frog in Egypt, it was a capital offense. And so he, pour, he poured the frogs into their land where they couldn't walk, they couldn't sit, they couldn't eat without stepping on a frog or hurting a frog. He goes, you like frogs? I'll give you frogs. And then they worshiped themselves, their pride, their willfulness, their national identity. The Pharaoh was a god. His family are protos gods until the, uh, one dies and then another one steps up. This whole identity, culture, worship, nation, that's what they worship. So the worst plague was yet to come. The death of the firstborn. 
It'd be a strike against the nation, a strike against their identity as a God-led people. The whole man-God system that political leaders had, have always tried to use. Look at any dictator throughout history. And that, that I am impervious, I am forever, I am dictator, God, king. God doesn't think much of that type of thinking. And he struck at it. God was about to unleash on this very dark night the angel of death into the streets of Egypt. The people of God, the Jews, would be safe if they did what God told them to do and did exactly what he told them to do. On the 10th day of the month, a young lamb without spot or blemish would be selected. It would be held until the 14th. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about that later. But they had to hold the lamb, get to know that lamb from the 10th to the 14th. And then in Exodus chapter 13, verses 4 through 6. Today in the month of Aviv, you're leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, You're to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast. And on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that this law of Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. I don't know if you noticed a couple of interesting things in there. One, he tells them, This is the night that you are leaving. They physically don't leave for a little bit. But they don't know that God's just kicked open all the doors. That God has taken all of the steps and he's getting them ready to go. And then he later says, I brought you out of Egypt with my mighty hand. It's already accomplished. You don't know it. You don't see it. You're still huddling in the dark room with the flickering of the tallow oil light. But you're already free. Palm Sunday starts Holy Week in Christian history. And as Al said, um, many of us came from churches in in independent and Protestant traditions where we had nothing to do with Palm Sunday or Easter because we were afraid that if we did, we might become Catholic. And we love you Catholics. We're all, we're all going to be there together and all going to be surprised at some things and thrilled about everything. So don't worry. But we were afraid. It was a slippery slope. My sister had a birthday in early April and she was never allowed to wear her new dresses or clothes to church at that time because people might think we were celebrating Easter. Of course, my thought even at six or seven was, won't they look at the rest of us then? Because, you know, we're all, we're all a bit shabby. That's all we've got. Uh, but you weren't allowed to say that out loud, so I didn't. But this starts for many people, and, and it's very commendable, a very contemplative, quiet, dark week. Ending with what we, we call Good Friday because of what good was done by the crucifixion. But even as a boy, I always wondered, why do we call it that? Shouldn't we call it the darkest Friday? But we we understand. The story continues. History didn't start 10 minutes ago. And it will continue. There's a goodness there. We need to know. And I don't know what position you're in. You might be fighting with depression or pain. I understand both of those things better than I wish I did. You might be fighting with... um, how to deal with a family situation, a health situation, a financial situation, whatever it is, this may be a very dark time. But you need to know, as Josh said in the greeting, God has already delivered you. He's already saved you. 
You don't see it yet because as human beings, we live on Friday. What we see is Friday. We're told Sunday's coming, but it's not here yet. But you need to know nothing that happens now will stop Sunday from coming. No one, nothing, neither height nor death, neither principalities, not Satan himself, nothing can separate you from the love of God. You just happen to be on Friday. But we believe, even as we're sitting with blood on our door, in the darkness, hearing noises we've never heard before, that we're already saved. As soon as the lamb was killed, its blood was to be sprinkled over the doorpost of the house. That was a sign to the angel of death, you cannot enter here. You cannot pass the blood. Now, is that some sort of magical, mystical sign or something about ghosts? Uh, you know, we had traditions about ghosts. I don't know if they're universal or not, but that they couldn't cross running water. You know, like a, a river or a creek. So if a witch was chasing you, get across. You know, we had all that sort of... No, no. This is a sign of a Sunday coming that they have no idea. That one day there will be blood that forms a barrier that cannot be crossed. Because of the love of God. And it has come to us. The lamb was to be roasted and eaten hurriedly with their shoes on. Well, you didn't, you didn't eat hurriedly back then. T meals took a long time. But you also certainly didn't have your shoes on inside because outside roads and outside places were not pleasant. I've had people say, wouldn't our air and everything be a lot better if we didn't have cars? No, no. I've been places where they don't have cars. They've got other, loads of mo uh, other modes of um, transportation that all have an exhaust, which is incredibly unpleasant. And I don't care whether you're talking about some place in Southeast Asia or Africa or whether you're talking about Mackinac Island in Michigan. There comes a time where you're going, and I'm done with the novelty. Um, the, I, this, is, this is not pleasant. So your shoes stayed outside. And in many cultures, they still do. Well, you are to eat in a hurry, ready to move, but not yet. Just as he did when he called his disciples. Just as we do when he talks about the end of time. And I know so many people are so fixated on the end of time and the signs of don't. You're on Friday. He's in charge of Sunday. Let's just be concerned about the end of us. Not the end of the world. He's in charge of that. And for us it's not a bad thing. As I told you from Bobby Hampton, one of our brothers who's on death row in Louisiana... Whenever they told him that they're restarting the executions. And he's in the line for that. And I ask him, how are you handling that, Bobby? And he goes, you can't threaten me with heaven. He knows it's Friday. But he believes in Sunday. Well, that night, only those who had the lamb's blood on the door. And they were able to move and ready to move were left untouched. The angel of death would not enter their homes. The next day would be a feast day, a feast that would last eight days. They're staying inside, eating and feasting for eight days. Why? Because of what's going on outside. And what's going on outside, they don't need to be a part of that. They need to stay away from that. Wrath and grief can turn to violence, we all know. So he's keeping his people inside feasting. The Passover, we know, because we heard a bit more of the story than they, they knew at the time, was a sign of what would come later through Jesus. Jesus was also called the lamb. He, like the required lamb, was male, without blemish or spot, slain for us so that death would not any longer enter us. It would no longer be a fearful thing. The angel of death cannot touch us. I will not say her name because we don't say names of our members out loud unless they've said we can. One of our dear members passed away about a month and a half, two months ago in Mexico. And it, it hurts that community. It hurts all of us. 
We understand that there had been a lot of pain and health issues in those last years. But we don't mourn her now as if, well, she had such a painful end and now she's dead. We say, we're so sorry she had a painful last few years. But we know where she is because death cannot pass the blood of Christ. And she is home. Just like the Passover lamb in Jesus' body, no bone was broken. The lamb was separated and chosen. Do you remember four days before it was killed? Now, why would you do that? Well, a couple of reasons. Let's just do the practical one first and then the real one. The practical one, if it's spotless without blemish, if you've ever been around sheep, you'd best keep it away from everything. Because sheep are not spotless and without blemish. I will never forget my dear recently departed mother had forgotten all of that. And she came across to see us when we were still living in Scotland. And she, as we were driving along, she saw the field of sheep just right there. And often they're right in the road uh, because they just don't know how to drive. So they're right in the road. And we call that a traffic jam on the Isle of Skye. One lane road and 50 sheep. And she goes, oh, I just, could you stop the car? I want to get out and hug one. And I went, no, mom. I, I don't say no to my mom. I never, I, that was just, but I said, no. And she goes, but, but they're just so sweet. I just want to, I said, mom, do you remember? They stink. And if you hug them, you're going to be co- covered with grease, if you don't know that. They're covered with lanolin. It's, it's actually, lanolin is made out of it, but it's this greasy stuff. And I said, they just look nice. So it's important to separate the lamb. But there's another reason. What happens if you have a baby lamb around you for a few days? Get attached to it. You do. This is why farmers that raise beef cattle don't name their cattle. You get attached to it. But then, what happened to Jesus? Jesus lived among us for a while. And he entered Jerusalem to all that fanfare for four days before he was taken to trial. They got to know him. Four days. Four days. Let's imagine a Passover. Let's imagine how it's still celebrated. Next year, by the way, we hope that we have the camera and gear if you continue to give and we're able to, to maintain our health and our faithfulness to actually have a Seder up here and go through all of it with you, with the different camera angles and such that would require for you to see. But let's imagine and see how it's still celebrated 3,500 years after that first night. Remember that the rules in Exodus 13, all yeast is to be removed from the house. Observant Jews, conservative Jews, Orthodox Jews, reconstituted Jews, some Reformed Jews, there are four major groups of Jews, will go through this process. It's ceremonial. There's a thorough house cleaning by the hostess, we're going to call her, the lady of the house. And then a ceremonial search. In other words, it's not, the husband's not going through looking for what the wife missed. It's ceremonial to show the children. He will walk through the house with a lighted candle, a wooden spoon, a feather, and a napkin. And all the kids, by the way, are following this. As he's looking, is there yeast in there? You know, and no, no, don't see any. Is that yeast? No. And they'll go through the whole house. Now, his wife will actually, or the hostess, the woman of the house, will actually leave a few crumbs on purpose in a place he knows well. And the children will help him find that. And oh, we have to get rid of this. And they'll brush it into a napkin, and then they will burn the napkin. The New Testament uses that exact same imagery. When Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, search yourselves to see if there's any leaven in you that shouldn't be there. Jesus warns us against the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees saying, you've got to search yourself. Don't even have a little bit of that judgmental, harsh, legalistic Pharisee spirit. Search yourself. By the way, something which I still do on a regular basis and I have yet to come up clean. Every time I think I'm done with being a legalist, 
I look over to somebody and go, they're not, and there you are. And the legalism has to be cleaned out. The judgmentalism has to be cleaned out. Well, the hostess then lights the candles, and the hostess does a lot of leading through this. She chants a blessing. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by thy commandments and commands us to light the lights of Passover. There's this quiet moment, then a table is set. Some items and traditions are absolutely set and have been for 3,500 years. But some items have changed because of reality. Since the temple is gone, there is no longer lamb. There is a single bone on a plate that represents the lamb and the loss of the temple. The loss of the temple is an enduring pain to our Jewish friends. That's why the prayer at the wall, and the wall is called the wailing wall. The only remaining structure of the temple is there. And the temple mount now belongs to the Muslims. And a Jew is not allowed to enter that area at all. If they are caught praying there, it does not go well for them. So they stop at the wall and they pray. Bitter herbs are still served. And every, every even little kids, it's a, it's a lot to do with kids. Passover has a lot to do with children. Do you remember the death of the firstborn? Every part of this has a lot to do with children. Why? They carry the story forward. We tell them the story. And they'll take a little bit of the bitter herbs and they'll make faces. And they'll say it's very bitter. And the, the dad or the hostess will say, this is to remind us of the bitter years of slavery. We need to remember where we came from, what God saved us from. We need to remember, as a country song said years ago, the broken road. We need to remember the pain. Sometime during the Babylonian captivity, it became traditional to place an egg, hard-boiled, roasted brown, on a plate to represent life. And yes, Easter egg hunts come from that, but boy, has that changed a bit. But again, East, I'm not opposed to them. Are you kidding? Let the kids have fun. And the whole decorating and such. Well, the egg came from there. Why? Boiled eggs last. And boiled eggs can be taken on a journey. In most hotels where I stay, there's a variety of foods, but there's also boiled eggs. And I already know a lot of hard workers, construction workers, people laying roads or, or re-roofing homes, they'll go over and get a, get a brown bag. If you ever see somebody putting a bunch of uh, boiled eggs in, you know that person works for a living. And they don't have access to refrigeration during the day. This is their food. The food of a traveling people, a people on the move. Then everybody has a pillow on their chair. Now, in the old days, you, you laid down and, and ate uh, the best you could, or you sat squatting, but you're supposed to be comfortable. And the, the reason everybody gets pillows is because that's to show you God has saved you, and now he gives us comfort. We're free from the bondage of Egypt. We are free to enjoy. They take their time to eat and talk. If you've ever been to other countries, you know that there are different traditions. Now, and I have always eaten quickly. I was the youngest. You had to get it while it was there. But also, that was just kind of our tradition is you, there's the food, you eat the food, you move on. Then you might go to Italy and you're going, this is taking two and a half hours. You know, and if you say that to them, they'll say that they're sorry for the rush. But it's, it's all about the experience. It's all about the talking and sharing. Small comforts like pillows are actually huge. I don't think we take enough time to say thank you to God for a pillow, a padded stool, lights. M most of our audience, 99.99% .99 of our Safe Harbor members, are out there somewhere. So you're not at a sound stage. If you have a glass of water or any other drink nearby, your coffee, the light, go ahead and take a sip and just enjoy how that feels going down. 
I've often thought, we just don't do that. I take a cue sometimes from my youngest, well, not my youngest grandson anymore, uh, but the youngest one in Tennessee. And he, we were sitting, I always sit at the little table because that's, these are my people. I don't ever want to not be at the little people, even though I now need help getting up from the little table. I can remember my wife had made some things for Thanksgiving, and we weren't really sure what the kids would think of it. He took one bite, and he just went, mm. he just sat there with it in the mouth for a while, then chewed it and swallowed it, and took another bite. And I'm going, there is no higher praise from any kid than, we don't even ask, do you like it? He doesn't even know he's being, it just makes an audible, mm. we don't do that enough. We don't take a drink of cold water on a hot day and just wait to hit and go, if it makes that noise, see your physician. (laughs) But feel it. And God in the Passover meal is asking them, enjoy comfort. Enjoy comforts during this. A cup of wine will be filled four times. Which, by the way, explains why the story of the Lord's Supper is not consistent. That was never brought up to me. But if you read the Gospels, you find that. Uh, and then Paul, you read bread, wine. But it, you read Luke, you, re, you see wine, bread. If you keep reading, wine. So I know why we didn't go to that one. But Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. The reason they drink four cups of wine is each one is to remind them of the I will statements in Exodus 6, 6 through 7. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Then there's a cloth laid out. There are three sections in it. Matzah, or the unleavened bread, is placed in each section. Sometime during the meal, the head of the household goes back and opens the cloth, takes out the middle bread, breaks it in half. Does this sound really familiar to those of you who grew up celebrating communion or Eucharist? Half goes back in a cloth. The other half is placed in yet another cloth. That place, that piece is called the afikomen, meaning that which comes after. We've all heard the tale. I don't know that it ever happened. It sounds like a preacher tale to me, but of a woman that wanted to be buried with a fork in her pocket. And the reason when the minister asked why, she said, because anytime you're at a meal and somebody tells you, keep your fork, you know something good's coming. So I I know something good's coming, so bury me with a fork. Again, sounds like a preacher story, but it's really cool. And it really fits this. There's more food. That which comes after. A treat will come after. And if you're thinking bread doesn't sound like a treat, that's, you're missing the point. I've heard from many people who have adopted children from developing nations. And one of the consistent issues they have is the children hiding food. Because they've never grown up where they knew it was coming again. They didn't know if it was coming. And they're hiding food. This is a way to re- reassure the children and us. Good's coming. Sunday is coming. It is real. Now the children are to hide their eyes while the father hides the bread. And then the youngest person present is supposed to ask four questions. During Mel Gibson's take on the crucifixion of Christ, one of those questions was asked, and that's, that's the part that hit me the hardest in the movie, it was as Christ is being taken down the Via Della Rosa, carrying his cross and the wailing and screams of the multitude and the rioters. And one of the women asked one of the other women in front of Mary, why is this night different from all other nights? That's the first question. Then 
The father speaks, tells them their story. Second question, why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Because it lasts longer than leavened bread. We must be ready to move. As I've said, God always calls us to be ready to move. Ready to move. Then third, why do we eat the bitter herbs? We've covered that to remind ourselves of slavery. Then why do we dip this vegetable in salt water? To remind ourselves of the tears we cried when we were slaves. So the four questions are asked. But now, no more tears. Why? Well, for the Jews, no more tears because we are on this side of the Red Sea. For us and for all believers in Christ, Gentile or Jew, it is because we are on this side of the cross. Sunday has already come. We just don't realize that we've already been brought out of all of this. We've crossed the Red Sea and the Jordan, and we will cross the next river as well. That river which separates us on Friday from our true Sunday. If you have your communion, please get it ready. Now, those of you that may be new to church and you're wondering, well, I don't have a little cup, what we call the rip and sip here. You don't, well, that was interesting. Um, you, you have to come to the sound stage sometimes. It's a fascinating place. Uh, it doesn't have to be something like this. It can be a bit of bread. It can be a cookie, a biscuit. It can be what you have to hand. It is not about the element. It is about what you remember. And then something to, to drink. They used wine. We have some grape juice in here. It can be water or it can be whatever. Before we take the bread, hear the words of the Lord in Psalm 114. When Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains leaped like rams. The hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled? Why Jordan did you turn back? Why mountains did you leap up like rams? You hills like lambs. Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool and hard rock into springs of water. As we take the bread, remember adoption into Christ, the one who caused our enemies to flee, has already brought salvation to us. We take the bread to remember the Son of God. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you for Jesus, his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection. Thank you for his conquering of death so that he, Christ victorious, can promise us that Sunday has already come. In the name of Jesus, the whole church says, Amen. Amen. As you ready your cup, hear the words of the Lord in Psalm 116, verses 1 through 14. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard me cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called out the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, O soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone's a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people. When Jesus said, take, 
drink. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you as if it already happened, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we, your people, remember. And the whole church says, Amen. We ask God's blessing as we sit on this Palm Sunday and learn from the Passover meal and the stories told for 3,500 3, years. And we pray for Easter morning when death will be defeated and our Lord raised up and revealed to all as the Son of God.